So today we're going to do phylogenetic trees and taxonomy. So taxonomy is, if you guys remember from uh, previous classes, taxonomy is the science of classification. Remember it originated with Linnaeus in the 18th century, where he was a botanist and he started classifying the plants that he was um, finding and coming across. Uh, the classification system, taxonomy, is going to be based on structural similarities, both internally and externally, and it goes through this, uh, you remember your domain, kingdom, uh, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Okay, so remember domain down here at the bottom, this is our broadest category, where there are three domains, uh, eukarya, bacteria, and archaea. And then in the eukarya domain, we have kingdoms, animal, plant, uh, fungus, protista is a little iffy, okay, since they're starting to dissolve that kingdom. A, and then we have phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. And this one here in particular is for the uh, leopard. And if you remember, the species name is done by the genus and species level. A, so, uh, for example, man is Homo sapien. Homo is the genus. Sapiens is the species. Here with the leopards, uh, Panthera is the, is the genus and Pardus is the species. Okay, uh, the domains down here, okay, so these domains down here, they are the biggest, broadest category, okay, and the domains were based on RNA differences, okay, and so the reason why we're talking about taxonomy here in classification is because this can lead back to um, evolutionary history, okay, the links that we find by, um, by classifying uh, link usually with taxonomic, uh, with evolutionary history. Okay, so we're going to focus the rest of this unit here on what is called phylogeny. Okay, so phylogeny is the study of our evolutionary relationships. So with phylogeny, what we're looking at is how these organisms are related uh, through time, evolutionary-wise. And I did not want to draw that there. Okay. And so phylogeny is based on a couple things. Okay, it's based on morphology, so in general what they look like. Okay, it's based on the fossil record, it's based on embryology, as well as DNA, RNA, protein similarities. Because remember, phylogeny is the study of our evolutionary relationships. And all of these things over here okay, help us um, with our evolutionary relationships. Remember, most of these are you know, pieces of evidence that evolution exists. So once we have determined these relationships, we can develop what's called a phylogenetic tree or a cladogram. Technically, the two of these things are different. Okay, um, the phylogenetic tree is our true evolutionary history, while our cladogram here okay, is a theory of the hypothesis of their relationship. But we will use those two words interchangeably as most biologists do. Okay, so what we have here, okay, so these are an example here of phylogenetic trees or cladograms. Okay, and so the phylogenetic tree or the cladogram again is just an illustration of this phylogeny, of their relationship. So, um, for example, what we have here is these three species of birds, okay, and we've got three possibilities of how they are related, okay, but they're the drawing here of how they are related, that is our phylogenetic tree or cladogram. All right, so when we're drawing a cladogram or um, a phylogenetic tree, we have usually on them, they will look like this. And maybe branch some more, okay, um, and maybe say this one branched, and then it's going to branch some more here. Okay, so your phylogenetic tree, you know, these would be examples of phylogenetic trees. And so these long straight lines here, okay, these are the population as it's going through time. Okay, and then these either went ends here, or sometimes you'll see it um, written like marks like this. A, that is the species of the population at any given particular time. A, and then these branch points or nodes, a, so we've got like, for example, there's a node here a, and here. So these branch points or nodes, a, those are where the split has happened, where the divergence between the two uh, with, amongst the ancestral line has happened. Okay, and so those are going to be important things that we realize what those are because you guys are going to be asked to 
uh, both read and interpret uh, cladograms, and also you will need to be able to um, construct one yourself. And we'll practice constructing, you will practice constructing one at the end of this lesson. So what we have here is an example of a phylogenetic tree. This is our um, example with elephants here. Okay, and so uh, let's kind of just look at the phylogenetic tree and, and you know just kind of see the parts here. So you can see all these various nodes here. So these are our branching points where things have diverged off. Okay, anything that has not made it here to this line right here to the top, okay, these things are extinct. So all of these here, these are all extinct. These are extinct. Okay, they have not made it all the way up to the top. So what we have along the top here, okay, these are still existing modern day um, organisms. So we've got elephants as well as manatees and um, hyracoida. I don't know how to say that. Okay. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what's up there then. Uh, so what we have looking at this cladogram, we show an ancestral link here then between manatees and elephants. And if anyone knows what a manatee is, manatees are aquatic creatures. Okay, they kind of look like a seal or a walrus. However, they are herbivores. They live in warm water, not cold water. Hey, okay, um, me growing up in Florida, I have act, you know, we actually spent a lot of time in water with manatees. Okay, and so manatees are actually more closely related. At first glance, people, many people think they're closely related to seals and walruses, but evolutionary wise, they're actually close have a closer relationship to the elephant. Okay, um, they are, again, because they're herbivores and just because of their ancestral uh, lineage here. Uh, something we need to keep in mind as well is that our cladograms can also be organized horizontally. So we could take this whole thing and we could uh, turn it on its side. So what we have here is, it's not the same cladogram, but it is a cladogram that is turned uh, horizontally. Okay, so it's running this direction. It would still mean exactly the same thing though. We still have our various nodes and divergent points. Okay? Then we have our uh, various species uh, throughout this cladogram ending here. Okay? So again, it's still showing in ancestral relationships in evolutionary history. They are just now, it's just now oriented a different direction. All right, so what we have here, uh, we have a little bit more voc vocabulary that we need to go through. So we have what are called taxons, okay? And these taxons, these are um, a group of species, okay? So each taxon is a group of species. Uh, every single one of these nodes should have, every single node or branch point should branch into two, okay? If there are more than two branches, like we have here where we have the three branches, that's what we call a polytomy, okay? A polytomy, again, we've got more than two branches. And what we have here is an unresolved divergence pattern, okay? It is understood in the scientific community that this will be te temporary. Okay, these polytomies, they are considered temporary because the, the idea is that in the future there will be enough evidence to um, knock one of those out to, you know, to really narrow down the divergence a little bit better. Okay, so again, the polytomies are considered um, temporary. Then we also have what are called sister taxa. Okay, so uh, B and C here would be an example of sister taxa. Okay, sister taxa are groups that share an immediate common ancestor. So you can see B and C here share an immediate common ancestor. So even though A, so we've got taxon A up here, even though A shares a common ancestor with B and C back here, they are not sister taxa because B and C have another common ancestor that is more recent. So B and C would be considered sister taxa. And something else we need to keep in mind too is that what is called branch rotation is okay. okay so if I took this here, and let's, uh, here, let's get rid of all my circles and my drawings and stuff. So if I took this phylogenetic tree here and I flipped it around one of the branch points, okay, around one of the divergence places, that would still be okay. It would still say the same thing. So let me show you. Let me show you what I'm talking about here. Okay, so let's put this one over here. and Let me bring in a rotation and we can see how it still says the exact same thing. It just looks slightly different. Okay, so what we have here are the same, this is the same phylogenetic tree. So 
So I've got the same phylogenetic tree as I had before. Okay, here's my original one that we have been looking at here. And this is our new one, and you'll see it was it has just been rotated around this branch point right here, but it still says the same thing. We still kept our relationships intact. Okay, we still have the one common ancestor here between A and then B and C and then B and C branch off. Okay, and then we still have the polytomy here. Okay, so we haven't changed any of our linkages here or any of our illustration. So let's look at what a clade is. Okay, so a clade is a, is a taxon. Remember, a taxon is the group of species. Okay, so the clade is the taxon that includes all the evolutionary ancestors. Okay, all the evolutionary ancestors of a common ancestor. It doesn't have to be the number one common ancestor, but of a common ancestor. So when we're looking at um, this diagram that we have here, all of these colored rectangles, like for example, the green, okay, that's one clade because we're referring to this common ancestor here. And then so up here, we would have, along the top here, we would have all of its ancestors. So that would be considered one clade. Okay, so now, if we look at all these other circle, all the other, um, all the other colored rectangles, okay, all of those also make a clade. Okay, like for example, the red is a clade in reference to this common ancestor. And so up here we include all of its descendants. Okay, blue is in reference to this common ancestor and all of its descendants. Yellow to this common ancestor and all of its descendants. So that's all a clade is. Okay, it's a taxon that includes all of the evolutionary ancestors. So here we have uh, a variety of clades. Okay, so I've got um, what we call a monophyletic group here in the front in the first one. Okay, mono meaning one. Okay, so a monophyletic group or is, um, is also called a true clade. Okay, so you may see this referred to as a true clade. Okay, so a monophyletic group or a true clade, this is a group with a common ancestor and all of its descendants. That's what we just looked at on the previous page. Okay, so on that previous uh, picture with the colored rectangles and squares, those were all monophyletic groups. Okay, I've got my common ancestor and all of its des descendants included in that group. Okay, so the monophyletic is uh, you know, pretty easy to, to determine. A paraphyletic group, this is the common ancestor, but it doesn't include all of its descendants. Like what we were looking at here, okay, in part B here, this is a paraphyletic group. So here's my common ancestor, but I'm missing this descendant right here. If I'm looking at group two, it leaves out uh, taxa G. So this would be a paraphyletic group. Okay. The last one is a polyphyletic group. And a polyphyletic group, that is going to con contain, um, it does not contain one unique common ancestor for all of the groups. So if you look here at group three, okay, um, taxa C up here does not share this common ancestor here. It shares it way back here. Okay, but does not share this common ancestor that's included in our group. So that would be a polyphyletic group. Okay, the mono and the poly referring here to more than one common ancestor. So for example, uh, C here, this polyphyletic group, comes from these two common ancestors, while the monophyletic group comes from just one common ancestor. Okay, so let's look at how we actually construct these. Okay, so uh, when we recreate phylogenies, we need to have a, a certain amount of information to be able to do that. Because remember, the phylogeny is, our evolution, is the study of our evolutionary relationships. And so the phylogenic tree is our illustration of this. So somehow we had to come to a conclusion about what these evolutionary relationships were. So we're going to get some input here from the fossil record. Okay, and keeping in mind that the lower down the fossil is found, okay, so the deeper in the sedimentary rock that the fossil is found, the older it is. Okay, so that helps us um, determine age, which is important in evolutionary history. Uh, we also use uh, homologous structures. We're over here. We've got our homologous structures. If you remember, a homologous structure is, I'll respell that for you. Okay, a homologous structure. These are ones that have a similar structure but a different function. Like the example here with the human hand, the dog, foot, the bird wing, and the whale flipper. All very different functions. Okay, but they have a very similar structure there. Okay, uh, so those homologous features 
those show that they are inherited from a common ancestor. So we can use that to show linkage. Um, and remember, a homologous feature does not have to be something as obviously structural like this. Okay? It could be uh, heritable traits, anatomy, like we have, like we're seeing here. DNA sequences can be homologous as well. Okay? Um, and proteins. Remember, proteins come from the DNA sequence. One of your homework assignments, you looked a little bit at cytochrome C. And one of the last lectures, we looked at cytochrome C and how cytochrome C is relatively, uh, it's a very common protein, and how it mutates at a, uh, you know, at a relatively constant rate. And so by uh, looking at the cytochrome C sequence, we could possibly see homologies. And we also have, when we're talking about homologous structures, we have the ancestral trait versus the derived trait. So the ancestral trait, this is going to be the original trait. So this will be the original shared trait. So for example, as we're looking over here with this example with the human dog, bird, and whale, there would be an ancestral trait that led to all of these. And what we have over here are the derived traits. Okay? This is the one that is in the actual newly evolved organism. Okay? We also have what are called analogous structures. And analogous structures are important because they're actually important because they are not used for creating phylogenies. They are um, almost distracting. Okay? They, are, they come from a different ancestor. So if we look here, so we've got a variety of, um, we've got a variety of diagrams here. So let's look first just here at the top. Okay? So when we're looking here at the top, we've got two types of wings. Okay? So we have this bat wing and the bird wing. Okay? The bat wing and the bird wing Okay, they are analogous structures. They are not homologous structures. Okay, if we look at their phylogeny here, um, down in the bottom of our evolutionary tree, we had four limbs evolve. Okay, and we're talking four like the number four. You know, like we have four limbs, we have two arms, we have two legs. Okay, and so over time, here we have the divergence. Well, bats are way over here. Birds are way over here. When wings developed was after the two of them had diverged from one another down here. Okay, so these are analogous structures. They came from um, a different ancestor, okay, and they are a result of selection pressure. For whatever reason, it was um, better for the bat and the bird to develop wings instead of arms. Okay, and there's a, you know, a couple of reasons how these could have come about. Okay, let's look at uh, another, whoops. Where's my, there they are. Okay, it's like, let's look at another example of one here. Okay, so here I have uh, these two moles. Okay, uh, these two moles, very uh, similar looking, very similar characteristics, very similar traits, because they do the same thing. They're mole, they live underground. They need a strong nose to be able to push through the dirt. Okay, they need big, heavy uh, front limbs to be able to, uh, and large claws to be able to dig through the dirt. And then they need a body shape that will allow them to move through the tunnels uh, relatively easily. But these two uh, moles are, live in completely separate places. Uh, one's from Europe, one's from South America. Uh, but they, so they are analogous uh, creatures. They, these came about due to selection pressure, not necessarily to ancestral relationship. If we look here at the fish and the whale, Okay, most of you guys know, because um, I showed you the video, of the wolf to whale video. Okay, and so this would be another example of an analogous structure forming. Okay, and this analogous structure would be due to evolutionary reversal. You all know from our activity that we went and did outside the other day, this wolf creature, you know, it actually came from the water. Remember, everything started in the water, and we worked our way out of the water. Okay, and so, but then it went back into the water. Okay. And so these are homologous structures. These, okay, the fish limb and the whale flipper, they are analogous. Okay, they are due to selection pressures. Okay, and uh, in this case, with the whale, evolutionary reversal. Okay, returning back to the water. So let's look here at what's called a molecular clock. So a molecular clock is uh, important for ancestral DNA sequences. It helps show common ancestral DNA sequences. And remember, that's our, kind of our strongest piece of evidence. It's the one that most people put the uh, stock in. And we can use it to um, develop our phylogenetic trees and our cladograms. So when we're looking at a molecular clock here, 
The hypothesis that goes along with the molecular clock is that among closely related species, a given gene evolves at a constant rate. Okay, so like we said with cytochrome C, uh, about every, uh, I think it's 17,000 years, don't quote me on that, uh, about every 17,000 years, cytochrome C mutates. Okay, so basically it has a, a cent, you know, it doesn't matter if it's 17,000 or 17 million years, there's a, there's a, a pattern to its mutation rate. Okay, and its mutation rate is relatively constant. And so based on this, we can develop these molecular clocks. Um, and so what this would tell us is that our amino acid changes should accumulate at a constant rate. Because if the gene is evolving or changing at a constant rate, then the changes in the amino acid should be relatively constant. If you think back to your homework question, you had that homework question about the meat, not the meat, the wheat versus um, the human and the fruit fly, and the fact that one had 43 differences and one had 48 differences. Hey, that would come back to this evolution, this molecular clock, okay, that they're mutating at relatively the same rate, and so it would show that humans and fruit flies diverge from wheat around the same time because they have approximately the same amount of mutations in them. So it shows a common divergence there with humans and fruit flies from the wheat. Okay. So if you look at uh, the diagram that we have here, so you can see that in our DNA strands, Okay, we've got one mutation that has happened. There's a deletion uh, followed by an insertion. Okay, and so you'll notice it changes our, the DNA just a little bit. Okay, so I have changed my insertion here. Okay, um, I've got my deletion. I'm sorry. I have my deletion that was there. Okay, I have my insertion added in here. And what we currently have is we have computer programs that can actually um, calculate where the mutations are and remove those mutations to then determine the essentially the ancestral DNA and see if that is homologous or not. So um, if we again just kind of sum it all that up with your molecular clock here. So if we have the common ancestor back here, okay, and so this um, whatever this lineage here mutates every 25 approximately every 25 million years. Okay, so one mutation, one mutation, 50 million years later, they both have two mutations. Okay, so after 25 million years, they had one mutation. After 50 million years, they have two mutations. And we would be able to uh, plug this into the computer and essentially calculate back to this to show their relationship. We can also use these molecular clocks, this information, to um, extrapolate some information. So what we have here on our graph so here we've got a graph of our molecular clock, and our slope of our line here, this is going to tell me my rate of change. Uh, here in biology, and you know, it, you know it applies in lots of other places, but you know, we focus a lot on our slope being our rate. Okay? And so our rate of change here, and so what I have here is my time over millions of years, and our amino acid differences. So my slope here is telling me how fa essentially how fast the amino acids are changing. Okay, and this can be useful because we could extrapolate data out from this. Okay, so if I have here at 500 million years, how could I extrapolate, extrapolate then out at 800 million years? What's going to happen? Or how many changes I would have? Okay, I can plug that into my y equals mx plus b. You know, I can find my slope of my line, plug that in. Okay, um, I know my y-intercept is 0 down here. Okay, so I could plug that in. Um, I'm sorry, my y-intercept is 0 down here. Okay, and I could plug that in for my 800 million years. I could plug in my 800 here, and I could determine my y for how many amino acid changes I could have. Okay, so think back to our algebra. You know, Remember, it's not different math just because it's here in our science classroom. Okay, so uh, if you need, all this is is another summary. I'm not going to read it to you. You can pause here and read it to yourself if you would like. Okay, but just looking at molecular clocks again, showing that steady rate of change and how you can use that to um, help form evolutionary relationships. Okay, so the last thing we need to look at are maximum likelihood and maximum parsimony. And so max maximum likelihood, these are how we determine if we have multiple options, like what we have down here. Okay, if I have multiple options for, um, for a cladogram, for a phylogenetic tree, how do I choose which one is the best? And so with maximum likelihood, 
I'm going to uh, choose the reflection of the most likely sequence of events, given my rules regarding DNA and DNA change over time. You know, I'm not going to pick that the DNA changes um, every one that shows the DNA changing every 5,000 years, and, and then it changes 20 million years later, and then it changes 10,000 million years later. I'm going to base my most likely sequence of events given the rules I know regarding DNA change. This other one, maximum parsimony, that's going to um, encourage us to always investigate the simplest. Okay? The simplest solution okay, that is consistent with the facts, okay? that keeps those facts consistent. So, for instance, looking here at our percentage of differences between sequences, and we're comparing a human, a mushroom, and a tulip. And I've got two choices here. Okay? And so, if I have 30% differences between humans and mushrooms, Okay, so to evenly you know, split that out here, I've got a common ancestor, okay, 15, 15. That gives me a 30% difference between the two. And then to get my 40% um, difference between a human and a tulip, okay, so I have 15 plus 5 is 20. There's my other 20. Okay, it's 40% difference between a mushroom and a tulip, 15, 5, 20. Okay, down here, though, okay, I have a much more complicated situation. Okay, and so based on our maximum parsimony rules, okay, that would not be our most likely uh, comparison, our most likely cladogram. So what I would like you to do is in your notebooks, uh, where you've been, uh, right across from where you've been taking your notes, okay, I just want you to try to build a cladogram off of this simple character table. So just looking at this character table, uh, I would like you guys to come into class Wednesday uh, with a drawn out cladogram, and we will check and see if you were able to do that correctly. And then we'll do some more practice in class.